Hi, this is Ted Price from Insomniac Games. Fall Guys from Mediatonic exploded onto the game scene this year, and in my opinion, is an incredibly entertaining multiplayer experience that just exudes pure joy. On this episode of the Game Maker's Notebook, I got a chance to talk to Joe Walsh, Fall Guys lead designer, and Joel Erber, the game's lead client engineer. Joe and Joel were wonderful in explaining the development process behind the game and sharing some of their favorite moments, along with many of the lessons they learned. Please join us for one of the deeper dives we've had on any game's development process. Welcome to the Game Makers Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Maker's Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. Joe, Joel, thank you so much for taking the time to come onto the podcast and and talk about Fall Guys and your experiences. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. I will say that, uh, I mean, I, like many, many, many others, am a fan just because uh, I'm so used to playing games that are serious and 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 ultra-realistic and just having the opportunity to to relax a little bit, laugh, and and just be terrible at something, which I am at Fall Guys, is, um, is a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was really the, the core idea initially was to try and make a multiplayer game that let you have fun while you're failing because that is it's not particularly fun to be shot in the back of the head by a sniper rifle from three miles away and that's (laughs) the end of your game and you know four guys we really wanted to make you laughing as you you got eliminated so i'm glad that it seems to be achieving its goal well i yes i mean you see you see it all over the place uh in comments and i'll just say too that it's also it's also for me personally um great to have camaraderie in failure because I can see many other people failing the same time I am. Yeah, it's a really interesting one because right from the beginning, one of the core pillars of the game design was that failing should be fun. And it's really interesting now the game is in front of people hearing that being like reciprocated back and we're hearing that back in the feedback. So it's really nice to see that follow it all the way through development, all the way to the final product. Yeah. Well, uh, well we're going to talk a little bit about the you know how you started the game, but I'd actually like to know more about just both of your backgrounds. Uh, how did you both get started in games? Well, I started out making sort of games for children, like working on projects with like uh, as an outsourcer for like Disney and Nickelodeon, and then uh, moved into making VR games, um, made some games like sort of small independent games before moving to Mediatonic. Did you, as a kid, did you want to get into games? Was that sort of your lifelong dream? I think my ambition hasn't really changed since I was a five-year-old. Like I think like Growing up around the late 90s was like the golden era for a lot of video games. So as soon as like I was playing these, it's like, I don't really know what I'm going to do, but I want to be involved in making games in some form. And I remember I had a family friend who was like a game designer, and I would always just ask him questions like, how do I get into industry? What do I want to do next? And I think initially I wanted to be a game designer, but then uh, speaking to my game designer friends that were in the industry, they're just like, become an engineer because then you have more opportunities. So eventually I started picking up engineering and just fell in love with programming. Was it true? Did you have more opportunities because you got into engineering? I think you have more flexibility. Like uh, like once you learn engineering, it's like generic to all industries. So you, you can try working in games or you can try working in other industries. So it's nice to have that flexibility. But I think there's something about programming in games where you get that instant visual feedback, which you don't get in a lot of other uh, programming industries. So I think that's one of the one of the reasons that makes programming in video games particularly like fascinating. Yeah, Joe, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I initially was like really into um, like composing music, like um, I studied music and stuff, and I really wanted to compose soundtracks for video games. And so I did a game design course just to try and learn a little bit more about what it would take to um, get music into games. Like, what's that What's that jump like? And then I increasingly found that I was better and more interested in, better at and more interested in game design than I was at actually making the music. Or well, the music I made was a little bit mediocre, I think. Um, and, you know, went the route of doing some QA and did an internship at Mediatonic. And I'm just like slowly, uh, you know, um, hammered away at that until I got onto a position where I could 
pitch games internally and, and come up with ideas and stuff like that. And so Fall Guys kind of came out of an internal pitching sort of session that we had as a team and the rest is sort of now history, I guess. That was about two and a half years ago where we had that initial pitch meeting. Wow, that's a pretty fast development cycle. Two and a half years for from a, just your pitch to the final game, right? Or less yeah, than yeah it's, it's, it's definitely felt fast <laughs> considering the complexity of the game. I think we, we really did turn it around. But one of the good things about Four Guys is that that initial idea is very, very close to what we ended up doing. And so we didn't have to spend months or even years figuring out what the game is that we were, we were trying to make. Like we changed things and we made decisions, but really the core of the game is very, very similar to that very first initial pitch doc that we sent around. Well, did you have a specific, a sentence or an elevator pitch that you used to convince people that this is a great idea initially? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the, the quickest one that gets people to understand it is, is Takeshi's Castle, but a video game is the, the key one that usually works or MXC, I think it's called in the U S and that was, that gets people understanding it. But alongside that, we were used to, it was basically the other pitch was the world's greatest game show, you know, uh, gang beasts, physics meets Mario party battle Royale was another thing that we, another line that we trotted out in interviews and in initial pitch meetings. And it just, it just resonated so well with people. They instantly get the concept. Did anybody on the team or people, people you were trying to convince to support the game doubt that the game would be fun at first? I think generally people were really enthusiastic about the core concept. Like I think people instantly grasped this idea of like, oh, I've never, I've never done that before. I've never lined up on an obstacle course with 59 other people. And I think that core concept got really excited, but we did actually tweak a couple of bits of the design based on some of the feedback we got from uh, other publishers who we actually didn't end up signing the game with weirdly, but one thing that they mentioned. So initially the premise of the game was that if you fell off of any obstacle, you would be eliminated. And so if you got, knocked into the like like you do in the game now if you get knocked in the slime you get eliminated but initially it was like any obstacle course like imagine seesaw it was going to be if you fall if you fall off a seesaw you're done that's it no respawns no nothing and initially the game wasn't one winner the idea was that you would reach the final round and um the people who made it through the final round would all share a portion of the pot at the end of the round so it became like the closer you got to the end, the fewer people you would want to win. So it was almost like the weakest link or something like that. And um, we got feedback from people basically saying, it sounds like your game's going to be really hard and that you're not going to have a good fun. You're not going to have a good time if you're bad at the game and it sounds too complicated. And so that was, we kind of took that feedback on board and, and changed it. And that's where we introduced the idea of like respawning and, and, and finding ways to make sure that even if you weren't very good at the game, you would have fun. And a big reference for that was like Mario Kart. So you can play Mario Kart with your friends and they can be like absolutely horrendous at the game. But the game is deliberately designed to make sure that they have a good time, right? Like they get all the best weapons or if you're at the back, things like that. People come around and lap you and you get to race again. You know, like those games are designed to be fun for everybody. And that was a bit of a turning point, I think, for the game where we realized that our initial design was a bit too hardcore and uh, only really catered to people who were really good at the game. I think that's pretty interesting that you talked about these things verbally before prototyping and actually accepted that they might not work. And I, uh, that's not always, I imagine not always the case for development teams. I know for us, we, we try to spend a lot of time in the game proving out things, but we also probably spend an inordinate amount of time arguing about <laughs> what will be fun and what, and what won't be fun before we ever try it. Um, were there certain mechanics in the game where that was the case, where you were just arguing incessantly about whether something would be fun? I think it wasn't necessarily a conversation of whether something would be fun. I think once we, what's unique about Fall Guys, I think, as a development process is like the concept of the game, like everyone understood quite quickly, like everyone like was familiar with Takeshi's Castle and like those sorts of game shows. So we went quite wide with the amount of ideas and there was just a whole fountain of ideas that we had to sift through. So it wasn't necessarily a conversation of which ideas would be the most fun. It was just like, which ones do we think will be, make the best game and result in the best game? So we had to whittle down all of our ideas, the ones that we thought would be best for the players. Yeah, totally. I think the rounds especially was like this real excitement of like, oh my God, we have so many good ideas and it's just a matter of figuring, figuring out which ones we do first. But there were some fairly tense conversations early on about whether we should have a sprint in the game. That was really contentious initially. Um, 
I was very much team no sprint because I felt like the game would become a racing game if you had a sprint button in and the people who won would be the people who got the best at managing their sprint meter or, you know, feathering the sprint button. It would have essentially become like a drift control from a racing game. And I was very worried that uh, that's what the game, the, the only people who would win would be the people who understood the drift, the sprint mechanic. But it was feedback we got a lot was like, oh, I wish I could sprint. This person's chasing my tail and I can't get away from them. Why can't I just sprint away? And it's very hard trying to articulate. They're like, yeah, but they're going to have a sprint button too, you know? And so you're going to run the same speed anyway. Um, so I remember that being fairly contentious, but the, the rounds themselves, I think, were was always filled with just lots of fun ideas. I remember player grabs was also a particular uh, contentious issue as well, just because it was quite difficult from a networking perspective. So we're backwards and forwards being like, oh, is this going to be fun? Like, w- will players enjoy if they're being grabbed, but they can grab other people? Um, and eventually it made it into the final game. And then we started like leaning into that. And that's where we sort of started to have rounds like tail tag, where the whole emphasis is on trying to grab other players. Well, yeah. Joel, speaking speaking of that issue with the, with the network, were you having... Initially, were you concerned about latency where somebody might press a button and then you don't see the results for a few milliseconds and it feels laggy? Was that specifically what you were worried about? Oh, yeah, totally. So I, it's also, I guess, like there's a lot of like client side prediction uh, where like you sort of try and predict what's going to happen with the network characters. So in like a first person shooter, someone shoots a bullet and they think that they hit the player and then the game server might say yes or no, you hit that player. But with something like a grab or something that's physical, you can physically see whether you grab that person. And then if the game server then rejects that message and says, oh, we don't think that you grab that person, then it, it's easier for a player to be like, hey, that didn't work out the way that I was expecting it to. So I guess it was always just trying to find a way to resolve these sorts of problems in a way that felt fair towards players as well. Did you rely on other research or other talking to other programmers who were uh, working on high player count games to to help figure out that predict those predictions, that prediction approach? I think generally like our game was quite unique because like it with like the high player count games, like they use lots of uh, tricks where you can like, I, I, like a game like Fortnite where everyone spawns all around the map. So you can sort of like render or like process stuff based on relevancy and how close someone is to you. But in Fall Guys, it was always the intention that everyone should start on the starting line and everyone should be together. And it's all about emphasizing that chaos. So I think that created quite a lot of unique challenges for us, particularly on like, balancing client performance because we can make the clients process more, but then it would affect their performance and how much we could push it to the networking uh, and push more of it towards the server, but that would increase the amount of network data that we could send. But then it was also a balance of responsiveness as well, because the more networking data that we send, the less frequently that we can send it. So yeah, it was keeping those three things in mind all of the time and finding the right balance. And it was a lot of prototyping. We hit went to and from several different networking models until we found something that felt right. Well, you actually mentioned the starting line, right? I mean, what you have with 60 players at the start must be the most challenging aspect of the, of, of the, ga- of the game for you, right, Joel? Is that, is that correct? Or, or are there other parts that were more difficult? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think initially, like one of the things that we were finding is that we were targeting a 100-player game initially. and. Mm-hmm. So our technical benchmark was based on working towards that 100 players. And then once we started playing 100 player like games, we started noticing from all departments, it's like, hey, it's quite difficult to like actually make sense of what's going on when you have 100 people starting in the same space. Um, So then like we had a joint conversation and we ended up reducing to 60 and we found that those were the games that were actually the most fun to play. So I think one of the advantages of that conversation is that we initially targeted 100 from a technical perspective we're expecting to work with that and then we managed to get that 40 players worth of performance back. Hmm. Did, what were some of the other trade-offs that you talked about when it when you uh, landed on 60 versus say 100 or maybe even fewer players? I think uh, a lot of the trade-offs were from um, like playability perspective. It was very noisy and very hard to understand um, when you had 100 players, particularly like one of the first levels that we had prototype was DoorDash. And when you had 100 players, it was very difficult to even get through any of the doors because there was just so many players all trying to get through any single door. Yeah, it was a a complete nightmare. Um, uh, But also as well, I think like during that conversation, we started to talk about other pros and cons. And essentially our pros list was like better networking, faster matchmaking times, more fun games, um, 
you know, better, higher quality visuals because we've got less things to render. And then the cons column, it was essentially just, we said it would be a hundred and now we're changing our minds. And ultimately when we like weighed those things up, it was actually, it wasn't, it felt really hard at the time, but um, when we actually came to make that decision, I think we never really looked back at all. Who had you made the commitment to when it came to a hundred players? Was that external, internal? So, I mean, it was, it was, Internal, so we'd said that and we'd agreed with Devolver that that was the, co- the concept of the game. But we'd also actually posted our E3 trailer, which mm. said in massive letters, 100 players, and it was on the Steam database. It was everywhere, basically. And so we knew that we were going to have to publicly change the player count. And that was something that we just really didn't know how it would go down. Like We were worried that people would just say, nope, we hate this game now, it sucks. <laughs> Yeah, I think for a long time it took us a while for um, sort of like press to stop reporting that it was a 100 player game once we made the announcement. But I think it also allowed us to sort of put more emphasis on the characters and make them a bit richer and like have more like difficult to render customizations and allow players to have more customizations as well. When we were targeting 100, we were talking about having a much more limited amount of customizations that the full guy could have. So it was definitely a better decision, I think, all around switching to 60 players. Mm. I mean, especially when, I mean, like, Joel, if you remember trying to get the game to run on PlayStation 4 towards the end, like, if you imagine trying to do that with 100, I think we would have been in real trouble. Yeah, totally. (laughs) Were you looking at any other large multiplayer games specifically to try to ferret out some answers before you made those calls? I think definitely like we looking at a lot of battle royales and the decisions they took, particularly around customizations, because that was probably the thing that we had most in common. But one of the things, as I mentioned previously, is like those games tend to spawn everyone quite far apart. And it's quite rare to have every single player all present within the same space. And even in some of those games, if you do manage to achieve that, then the performance will drop. But we started to see that like the games like Fortnite that are quite limited and clever about like giving you things that feel like customizations, but from a rendering perspective, they're quite cheap. Um, it definitely it helps the performance of that game perform a lot better. So we started to try and lean towards those things of like our patterns and our skin and the color tones that you can select, we get them for essentially free. And the costumes are probably the, the top and bottom costume are probably the most expensive things, but we chose to only have two of them. But initially at one point in development, there was conversations of having much more. Got it. And so just because it's fun to ask, do you find that there are specific skins, costumes, combinations that are the most popular now that the game's been out for a while? I think it depends generally on which one has been the most recently released on the Crown Store. Like I, as soon as we release something, I'm always surprised at how quickly everyone has it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, people, it's really varied, actually. Like when you go online, I've, I've been surprised. I thought there would be costumes that everybody's wearing, but it's it's pretty pretty split. People really like the inverted faceplate that we released recently, which is like darker face with white eyes, which is like really stark, and you need to have won games to earn it. Um, I'm seeing that a lot these days. Was that part of the plan from the very beginning, just an emphasis on customization, or did that come in late? I think... It was, there was always an emphasis on customization. Certainly when I joined the project, it was one of the first things that I was looking at. Um, it's like, okay, here's all the customizations we want to support. How do, how do we go about doing that? But I think one of the things that I was most surprised about on this project, particularly when we were sort of like a small project that no one had heard of, is all of the partners that we approached to sort of like come make costumes or can we feature their IP in their game were super responsive and pretty much all agreed unanimously without any, any issues. That's really impressive too, that, that people were so, other partners outside of Mediatronics were so interested in, in just jumping in. Makes sense. I mean, but were you, yeah. was, it, was it a legal nightmare for you guys or was it pretty straightforward? It's pretty, pretty straightforward, I think. Like, um, I, don't, I don't think we had too much problems with either Valve or Sony, who were like the, the two, no, no. Um, yeah, Valve and Sony, I guess, were the two partners that we were working with up to that point. And I guess Devolver too. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, a big thing, right, is that we're not selling these items in the game. There's not a real money purchase anywhere, which makes everyone's life a lot simpler. Right. I think I was waiting for the moment all the way through development where it was going to become a problem, being like, oh, someone said that you can't use this costume because you can customize it and change the colors of it or something like that. And I remember there was a point where we wanted to add team games and we were just like, okay, we need to recolor the costumes. And I'm sure some IP holder might have an issue if we recolor one of their iconic characters. 
but pretty much everyone was unanimously pretty accepting and really easy to work with, which yeah. is amazing. Yeah, I think a big part of it is that, like, kind of like you said, like we the initial the initial pitch for this game had like quote unquote infinitely customizable characters in the pitch, and mm. so we designed the character to be like a real mix and match, like Funko Pop meets Mister Potato Head, you know, aesthetic, and so that's always been baked into the character at like a really fundamental level. So it's been really easy for us to just like throw together a mock-up of, you know, GLaDOS from Portal or um, Jacket from Hot Mami. And just anyone who sees that is instantly like, oh my God, get it in the game. It's perfect. And so that's just made our life a lot easier when people see the mocks, I think. I think it definitely helps that we have Dan working on the concept art that we send over to the various IP holders. And he was working on the Funko Pop game that we did for, for Gears of War. Um, and he was turning around concepts that the Funko Pop people were just like, these are amazing. So I think his concept art really managed to sell the iconicness of the characters. That, yeah, picture's worth a thousand words, right? And I mean, that I know that from, from our perspective at Insomniac, same thing. When you see people kind of re, re-envisioning your characters, it's it's exciting. Um, I know too that personally as a player, yeah, I'm going to gravitate towards Gladys or, or, or some other character that's familiar. And if I can play them in a game like Fall Guys, it's really, it's it, it's it's special. Makes me feel kind of cool as a player. Very cool as a player. Um, would do you as a as a company have favorites um, that you gravitate towards? In the game, Ooh, um, I quite like just combining things into be the most garish, hideous combination I possibly can. I think right now my character has like the pink owl with lime green underwear and the lime green faceplate as well, and it's just a mess of pink and fluorescent green. Which I, my strategy is just to try and like garishly freak out all the other players. So they don't really know what's going on. And then I steal the crown from underneath them. I think my favorite is probably the beta testing costume. Uh, We created like a crash test dummy costume, which was exclusive to the beta testers because we had thousands of beta testers helping us out before launch. And we Mm. just wanted to reward them with something special. So we created this crash test dummy. But because it's so exclusive and no one really has it, whenever I wear it, I get accused of being a hacker by everyone that I'm playing with. Well, speaking of that, though, do you have developer-specific costumes that nobody have? We do have a pattern which has the Mediatonic logo, which we only award to people that are on the development team. But um, no one seems to notice that much when we actually wear it. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Well, you know, you mentioned uh, the testing. Before you went to beta test, how did you get, how did you find 60 people to play your builds? Good question. Um, So we've relied a lot on automated testing. Um, One of the things that we realized quite early on is that we had quite a small QA team as well, and it's very difficult for them to get reliable data. So initially we started uh, prototyping with bots and we had bots that could play through the game and that sort of gave us a good amount of data about like the performance and how things would render. But one of the things that we're really missing out on is measuring how the network traffic flowing into the server was going to affect performance. So we started spinning up sort of like fake clients, which we would also run on the server. um, And they would simulate playing the game and simulate actually pressing inputs. And we could sort of set them up to like sort of do random behavior or all bundle on top of each other and try and create a worst case bottleneck scenario. And that was super helpful for us identifying both server performance and client performance and also helping QA fill out the lobbies and test what the qualification system works like with the full player count. That sounds incredibly smart and useful. And if, given that there are probably other people listening who are wrestling with the same challenges, do you have any specific advice if people are going to be doing automated testing, things that you've learned from that process? I think one of the things that's always important about automated testing is identifying the areas that are probably the most fragile about your code base. I think going forward, it's always nice to have as much confidence as possible. So if there's a certain section of your code base, which is either very difficult for QA to test because it has a bunch of dependencies or is just very integral to your game, identifying those sections and writing suitable tests as soon as possible is always the best thing to do. And also ensuring that your tests are run frequently enough that you get good data from them. I think sometimes if you only run a test like every day or every half a day, then it's quite hard to pinpoint the exact hour that something might have changed that affected your game. But also, I think one of the 
best things that we did on Fall Guys is ensuring that we have a suite of tests that run on every single commit change that went it back into the project. Mm. So it always meant that our, our developed branch was always as stable as possible. Did you have somebody specifically managing those tests? We have a team, a small team at Mediatonic, which are our test and tools team, SDEP team, which have been great. And they've sort of been writing sort of systems to help us automate. And they helped us write the fake clients and things like that. So I think having that separated to the team has been quite an advantage because we haven't necessarily had to allocate much of our team's time towards creating these things. And we've managed to get all the fruits of that labor. But I think one of the things that we found going forward that is also best to try and bring some as much of that back into the team because generally whoever's writing a feature knows how best to break it um, rather than an external team so they should probably be the ones writing the test yeah so uh before you started doing testing what was the very first prototype you got up and running for the game oh i think the first thing we started doing was basically figuring out what the control scheme was going to be um, we because we knew we were going to have very simple controls, but we didn't really know what that was going to mean. Um, but we knew that we wanted to have like grabbing in the game that just felt like it would be part of the puzzle of building out our levels, our suite of levels. And we kind of knew that we wanted players to interact with each other in a meaningful way. Like if everybody was just running towards the finish line, it's just going to be like playing track mania or something Like you might as well all be, doing your own separate thing and recording your split times at the end. So grabbing was like a really big thing. And that became the focus of the early prototypes. And we spent months working on like grabbing and moving blocks around Like we were convinced that building, building things was going to be a big part of four guys, like building a ramp to get over an obstacle or like carrying blocks from one end to the other. And so we spent a long time trying to make grabbing feel good. Um, grabbing small objects, grabbing large objects. Like this was even before we even got on to grabbing each other. And weirdly enough, it didn't even make it into the final game. Like we have carry in the final game for um, egg scramble and a couple of other levels, but it's only now with season two that we're actually getting rounds to finally implementing this, like grab giant moving blocks and, you know, clamber up walls and stuff. But initially that was like a big thing was like we talked a lot about jumping on each other's heads and climb using other people as ladders and all of these like really ambitious things that ultimately like fell by the wayside when we realized how complex they were going to be um but so the early prototypes was like grabbing was a big thing building building ramps was a big thing and then trying to figure out what made a full guy unique was was a huge thing and that came with making the full guy fall over like was was probably the big one <laughs> um we knew we wanted it to be like n- knocking each other over right like we knew that was going to be we thought it would be based on impact and and then it became a big thing about figuring out like once you've fallen over how do you get back up all, all of these types of things so yeah first prototype was grabbing stuff and falling over for about the first three or four months of development yeah, I think ironing out how ragdolls worked was like a big part of the development process. I think initially as a prototype, we had a sort of like Weeble-esque full guy that was sort of like pivot from the bottom, was very bottom heavy and then would self-write itself. And then we started being like, okay, we need more floppiness. We need to feel like these ragdolls like are like really players that are getting thrown around. And I guess one of the interesting things about full guys is like generally with a networked game, like ragdolls are never not generally networked. Um, if you're taking something like Overwatch, when some, you shoot someone, they die, then the ragdoll just plays out on the client and the character just falls to the floor. And initially, we tried to work within that same framework as well because networking all of the data for all of like the limbs and the joints and stuff like that would be quite expensive for 60, 60 characters. So we had to f- try and work on ways that we could send as little data as possible. So we initially tried to make it so we didn't send any data for the uh, for the ragdolls, but then it became quite apparent that the movement of the characters is also defined by the movement of their limbs. Like if someone's like limb gets caught on like the side of an object, then they're going to fall differently than if they're not simulating that ragdoll. So then we started having a lot of back and forwards about how we actually network a ragdoll uh, until we finally came up with the solution that we have in the final game. It sounds like you had to make a crazy number of decisions really early. So what, what's your team process at Mediatonic for doing that? I think I think proving things out as soon as possible. And I think trying to fail quickly as well. So like usually we'll gather people together. Um, we'll have like a pitch of like, here's the concept of what we want to achieve. Like Joe will also usually come 
with some ideas about like, here's how I want it to feel. And here's some like videos that I've recorded of myself leaping around or something like that. And then we use those as references to trying to achieve a certain effect. Um, and then we prototype as frequently as possible until we feel like we've got, got the right thing and create the right balance. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, I will say as well, like this ragdoll thing was not solved early in development. Like we were working on this until I guess what felt like the zero hour trying to get everything. And we went back to the drawing board probably like three or four times, I think with, with new versions, because we'd, it's, you know, it's one of the hardest things, right? Is you're working on something and you don't know, is this thing a week from working? Is this thing a day from working? Is this thing never going to work? And so I think we went down a couple of rabbit holes on the, on the ragdoll side before we really figured it out. But I think it was, I mean, it was definitely this year. It was probably like, I don't know, spring, summer, Joel, before we actually finally found the right solution. I think it was like February, March. Yeah. Like p- player grab was one thing that was like, we were not, we were working on it until like the very last moment. We weren't sure we we're going to be able to find something that would like tick all the boxes. And also networking the ragdoll was also one of the big moments that once we found something, it's like, okay, this is great. And I think we got close on several occasions using various different methods, but then like it would fall down at the last hurdle and it wouldn't like work when you got hit by a fast hammer or when you're jumping around or something like that, or it would just send way too much networking data that we can actually process it on the server. Yeah. I think essentially like our, the process was basically looking at, looking at the pain point and discussing whether or not we felt like that was vital to the success of the game. And so something like, like I remember at one point when you grabbed someone, you could kind of throw them. Like it was more of a chuck that you could do and you know, looking at the network, it was like moving other people that fast was going to be a real issue. Mm-hmm. And we just basically had to sit down and like, realistically, is this actually going to, is this going to be the thing that makes or breaks the success of four guys? And it felt to us like being able to chuck someone versus being able to grab someone and hold them and slightly move them. Is it, is it worth, you know, five, six months more iteration on this or should we just cut our losses? And so that was an example of like, it's quite easy when you frame things like that to make those decisions. Um, but then something like player grab was one where we were like, no, this has to be in the game. Like we should do basically everything we possibly can to get, get some sort of player grab in the game because it's so fundamental to that core vision. Can you imagine if we still had the chucking mechanic where you could drag someone around and throw them around? That would be absolute carnage. Oh my God. Yeah. I'm so glad we didn't do that in the end. (laughs) Well, well, actually the answer is another question of mine, which was more about failed experiments, things that you tried might have been fun, but you just had to get rid of them. And that sounds like a great example. Yeah, definitely. I think and there were a whole suite of round ideas. Like when I mean, we said before, like we had all these great ideas. It's like we had a load of ideas for rounds that we thought would be great, but we ended up cutting at, at various points during development. We had one that was like a giant minefield where you, oh, yeah. you God, every full guy was wearing, I was big into this idea for a bit that like we would attach things to full guys for various different rounds, like a fishing rod or like some stupid thing. And then they would use this new attachment. And that was kind of where like tail tag came from originally. But the idea was that all four guys were wearing a helmet with a red light on it. And when they got close to a mine, this red light would flash. And so as a team, you would figure out the route across this minefield by looking at each other's helmets and figuring out the safe route. I don't know why I thought this was a good idea, but I did. (laughs) And then when we tested it, everybody just runs forward like maniacs all the time. And... (laughs) I, I remember getting some pretty stern looks from my boss being like, why did you spend two weeks of our time prototyping a minefield? Because this is totally, <laughs> completely wrong and just doesn't fit in any real way. But it, it seemed like a good idea at the time. I think that's one of the things that we found. Like there was, It was quite difficult to find round ideas that were easily understandable because we don't have much like sort of like tutorials or anything like that. And it's supposed to be like, we'll chuck you in it and see if you understand it. So like, again, it was, it was difficult when we had levels that required a lot of collaboration or if like it wasn't instantly understandable what you're doing. It's very difficult getting 60 players to all collaborate and work together to do something, particularly when they don't have any way to communicate with each other. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I will say though that... Joe, the the minefield thing does sound on the surface really fun. I mean, just seeing <laughs> little fall guys being blown across the screen. I guess maybe frustrating as a player to be that one who's getting blown across the screen. But um, yeah, I think ultimately that evolved into what tiptoe is today, which is this mm-hmm. like the safe route across the field with tiles that disappear 
and a group figuring out like i think that's just a much stronger idea maybe we never would have got there if we didn't do minesweeper first but yeah <laughs> i don't know the helmets thing was a big misstep <laughs> it's pretty funny though i so in, in addition to some of the other the mechanics that you tried and, and maybe didn't work out were you ever tempted to add other bells and whistles to the game like story or anything that on in retrospect seems completely wrong for the game but at the time felt like it would be a fun well yeah do you remember action replay joel boy do i <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we had a system which was like uh it would record the ideal moment of the game and then it would replay it back for all players at the end of the game and i think i remember for a large part of development it felt like this was like an essential feature but it was becoming an absolute nightmare for us to to work out and i think also when we were prototyping it and playing it it's like the replay just looked completely distorted and nothing like what actually happened in the game so eventually like we made a difficult decision to cut it but um it w- did hang around in the project for a very long time <laughs> Yeah, Again, we it sounds like, like a it sounds like a great idea. Yeah, we were like, I was pretty convinced that it was really important because when you watch MXC or Takeshi's Castle or these these game shows, they have this ridiculous replay, slow mo replay at the end that like wraps the whole thing in this like really strong game show aesthetic. And I just thought, like, so we need to keep this game show element in the game. It has to still feel like a game show, and that action replay is a chance to highlight players and make them feel like celebrities. Um, but we even had people tell us like these replay systems are hard like everything has to play perfectly all your sounds have to play everything needs to and at the time i just thought like i don't know how hard could it be really it's only a replay system it's just all the data being restreamed back but um yeah that was a that was a a lot of work that's a great example uh so if you were to go back to day one the day after you pitched it and everybody's excited about it and we're looking ahead at two years of development what are just a couple things you would change? Well, de-scope massively, I think. Hmm. Um, I wish we'd, I wish we'd started with a, an, a concept of the game that was a lot closer to what we ended with, because I think we had we spent a lot of time looking into hugely challenging features that ultimately I think we could we have launched without and. And I think we spent a lot, of, like, a lot of sleepless nights considering very big features that we just didn't have the bandwidth as a team to make. But we had the optimism, I think, that we could do it. And I think if I were to pitch this game again, I think I would have pushed harder to launch with a smaller MVP version of the game and see how that does before we committed to really big adventurous features. But it's hard because they feel essential at the time. You know, I guess a big one is like um, split screen, for example. It's like... For a long time, the idea of launching on PlayStation without split screen was just like absolutely unthinkable because it just felt like a great game to play alongside other people because it's so funny and it's so watchable. Um, yeah. What, what, was, what was, was that a, a rendering issue or a network issue? Yeah, it, was, it would have put a huge strain on us from a rendering perspective, from a networking perspective. We did have some early prototypes that we were testing it out, but it used a single camera for, rather than doing split screen. Hmm. Um, but towards the end of the development, once we had all the art going and sort of all the VFX and stuff, we were sort of like we, when you're playing VFX for all 60 characters and everyone can be on the start line, having to do that twice would have been very expensive or three times or four times. Um, so, and it was also just, we would have had to create like new systems to allow people, everyone to interact both at the same time of all the menus in a split screen context. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm sure this is a, a conversation that pretty much every multiplayer developer has at some point, right? The the, the trade offs of split screen versus single screen. Um, that's a tough one. Yeah, um, it's, it's difficult because I think as a studio, like we're all such big fans of split screen, and it was a very difficult feature for us to drop because like we're all, we really wanted to make it work. But like if we were just looking at the amount of work that we had to do to get the game over the finish line, it just wouldn't have been practical for us to. To probably attempt to <laughs> definitely. You know, what's What's great is that you you talk you talk about how you would descope. Um, what are some of the approaches that you'll apply to the next game, given what you've learned about scope and maybe how you guys discuss scope on the team? I think 
from my perspective, I think we spent a long time in pre- we really focused on gameplay mechanics during pre-production. That like we really focused on the feel of the full guy because that was a big thing for us as a studio was proving out that we could make a character that feels as good as any other, you know, AAA character or at least shoot for it. And I don't think we spent enough time on scoping exercises. You know, you hear a lot about you know, teams getting their playing cards out and everybody rates how big a feature is going to be. And then you have a great sense of like how big the game is going to be. And it kind of felt like we just didn't really spend enough time early on really talking about scope and what it would mean and the harsh realities of, of things. I think it's one of the hardest things in, in game development is because you always kind of feel, you always feel like things are going to go well this time. <laughs> and then inevitably they don't. And you end up in these really uncomfortable positions. Um, so I, I think, I think spending more time specking out the game early and like estimating things in a more detailed way and really talking about them, I think would have saved us a lot of time rather than like rushing through the scoping exercises and being like, yeah, 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 let's just start building the game. We'll figure it out later. I think it was probably a, a mistake in hindsight. I think also like having even like a penciled in, like this potentially would be our release date would be a really handy thing to have going forwards because like you, it's difficult to scope a game when you don't really know how long you have to make it. And I think that was a conversation that was in flux throughout development that made it quite difficult for us to fully scope out like, okay, these are all the features that we can get done in that amount of time. Was there, Joel, was there a certain time of year that you guys wanted to hit or was were there any real constraints that you had around picking a, a launch date? Um, I don't think that there was like a specific time of year that we were targeting, but I think it was just a conversation that was in flux depending on like uh, the, the budget of the game and things like that. Yeah. Speaking of the, the industry at large, were there any other games that you viewed as direct competition and either existing or upcoming games that you were either looking at as uh, trying to stay away from or were... Uh, trying to differentiate yourselves from? I mean, you mentioned Gang Beasts earlier, which you know is, is a lot different, but has a similar stylistic, humorous uh, uh, look. Yeah. Yeah, I think the other big one for me was Rocket League, I think is probably mm-hmm. the closest game. Like, I don't think maybe competitor is, is not the word I would use, but it, it fills this niche of being a online competitive game that is instantly understandable like you see cars in a football and you get it and you're, oh great i know what i'm doing but it's also hilarious to play when you're rubbish and really good to play when you're amazing at it and yeah. i think rocket league is probably the closest example although it doesn't share any of the like massive multiplayer dna i think as a as a full package it's probably the closest thing and something we looked at a lot during development uh, in, in lots of different ways I think also PUBG and Fortnite were also big references for like how they approach certain features and like the interactions that they had outside of the game um, and getting people into games as well. I think Mario was also a big reference because like we had on one end of the scale, we had a Mario like character controller, which feels like very responsive, like a platformer. And on the other end of the scale, you have Gang Beast, which is very floppy and sort of the fun is how difficult in playing it is how difficult it is to control. So I think it was always like a sliding scale of like um, how floppy should the character be? How responsive should it be? And it was finding that middle ground that felt both like competitive, but also fun. And at one point in development, we sort of like had a character controller that felt a bit more Mario-esque. And then we had a conversation with Joe. It's just like, I think a lot of the fun has come out of the game because like the character is a bit too responsive now. So then we started adding more floppiness and unresponsiveness and um, interesting collisions where with other objects as well. That makes a lot of sense. And, uh, and, and thanks for sharing that. I mean, I think it's something that all teams are, are generally look, I know that we look at other games as well and are sort of helping uh, those games help us shortcut some decisions uh, about where we want to be. And to your point about the sliding scale, that sounds really valuable, right? Having a talking to the team about, Hey, here's, Game A, Game B. We want to be somewhere in between. Let's let's see where we can start moving yeah. things around. I think it's re- it's really valuable, right? Um, because it essentially allows you to uh, unify the team because you can basically go around everyone on the team and be like, on a scale of Gang Beast to Mario, what do you think Fall Guys should be? And then you can collate all of those responses and you can get a sense of how aligned the team is. Because if one person thinks the game should be Mario and the other person thinks that the game should be gang beasts. You really shouldn't do any work until you align those two people. And I think that's been 
a big thing on Fall Guys is finding ways to, in a game that is very different to anything else, align people to ob- talk objectively about the thing that we're making um, has been a big, big process. Yeah, it's really important to have those reference points. But I think one of the things about Fall Guys is that there hadn't really been a game that did sort of like mass multiplayer ragdoll physics-esque like gang BC sort of style gameplay. So there wasn't necessarily a blueprint of like, here's how you do this sort of game and here's how you solve those sort of networking concerns. So a lot of the time it did really feel like we were sort of trying to work things out as we we're going along and trying to work out how we could push the performance and push the networking and write our own networking system to get everything working smoothly. Got it. Makes sense. Well, I, I could ask you questions all day about the, the sort of the mechanics and, and the decisions you went through, but um, I do want to get your perspective on the industry in general. So when you think about where the our industry is headed as of today, what gets you most excited? Well, I think personally, I am quite excited by VR, especially. I think like I'm, I'm probably going to pull the trigger on a Quest 2 pretty soon as being someone who's not bought VR at all. I think seeing Valve jump on jump on that train and make Half Life Alex has been really exciting to see people mm. lean into that space. Um, it still feels like there are so few games which people will play for longer than forty five minutes ever, but I think it's going to be really interesting as the tech grows to see people lean into that space more and more. I think from my perspective, it's just the ability to try and tell richer stories. I find it really interesting the way that sort of games are just getting more ambitious with the themes that they're trying to approach. Like if you compare like what God of War was doing 10 years ago to compare to what God of War did in 2018, it feels like there's a vast step up in the sort of themes and maturity of the story content. And I'm sort of excited to see how games mature and sort of become on par with film and start advancing the narratives a bit better. Me too. I totally agree with that. Uh, do you think that the industry needs to change or evolve any, any way, uh, any specific way, or do you think uh, we should keep rolling the way we do, which is, at least in my opinion, a little bit chaotic? I think there's definitely some room for more inclusivity. I think diversity across the board is something that could be improved. And the more diverse voices that you have contributing to game design, the more different stories that you're going to get out the other side. Joe, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I was going to go, go, go talk in a completely different way, but for me, it's just like I still feel like people haven't really figured out how to make games efficiently or in a sensible way yet. It's just chaos. And the amount of stories you see coming out with every single AAA game about you know the insane hours that people are doing, it's just it still feels like we have a long way to go as an industry for figuring out how to do these things in a sensible way sustainable way because i think the four guys for me is like the first time i've been on something that's a huge success and that process is exhausting of of, of of trying to hit that deadline and trying to get that game out and we've been pretty good as a studio up until this point but i just it just feels that like when you see all these horror stories come out from other studios that we we need to solve that if we want this thing to be a, a long-term career for people yeah, I think it's about making things sustainable because I think like we sort of invest more money and more time and like you have like your AAA games that are made with like so many hours, but then like the expectation is always growing of like how long is a single player game, how much content should be in a free to play game. So I think as those expectations keep growing, so do the like the budgets and studios. And I think as an industry, we could probably improve in putting more focus on sort of like people's personal lives and like work-life balance and ensuring that people can stay in the industry for a significant amount of time. I think also as an industry, we put a lot of focus on uh, success stories of people that are quite young, but not necessarily enough success stories of how long has someone been in the industry and still managed to have a sustainable career as well. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, Well, so when it comes to things that we could do to say manage expectations, uh, do you have some specific ideas? And I, I shouldn't say manage expectations. Like to, to you talked about a couple of things. One, we have incre- constantly increasing expectations, and I'm guess you all are referencing player expectations. And then we have the importance of sustain sustainability within our industry and making sure that people actually have work life balance. So first, really, are the expectations being driven exclusively by players? And then second, what are some things that we can do to to make this industry more sustainable? 
I think it's interesting this year because it feels like some of the big success stories coming out this year are from much smaller games. Um, like Among Us is something that mm-hmm. comes to mind when I say when I say that, and potentially poor guys you could include in that as well. Mm-hmm. So I think the it's not necessarily about player expectations because I think players can be wowed by something that's like simplistic but feels fresh to them. I think it's just um, that growing need to always have something that's bigger and better, and that's usually pushed by the AAA side of things. I would say, yeah. I think one thing that I'd, I'd like to see more of, and I think that we've been trying to do, is to put a face on game development and to make sure that the people behind the games are seen and that the stresses of game development are understood by the players. Like I think more dev diaries, more blog posts from people, more open communication from studios, I think really helps people understand why things are taking longer or why things need to be delayed when they are. And I think I would like to see more of that. I think... We've seen it personally, like you get messages online from Fall Guys fans who are very passionate saying, you know, why is this, it's a joke that this hasn't been fixed. It's been two weeks and you've not fixed it and it's and it's pathetic. And it only really takes like me to go on and be like, hey, we know this needs to be done and we're trying. And those people instantly kind of like soften up and, and are suddenly like much more understanding about the, the stresses and the pressures of game development. So I'd like to see more of that essentially. It's been really interesting working with Oliver as well, because usually as a game development studio, like if something's going wrong or like you're trying to work on something, you tend to close off and try and fix the issue. And Oliver's always been like an advocate for being like, no, let's try and communicate more and explain the issues and people will be more forgiving. And in our case, we've definitely seen that. Hmm. Do you ever think about uh, changing the development process to be even more open along the way from start to finish? I think it depends because I think to a certain extent, there's also a pressure to be first and to have an original idea come to market. So I think if you're too open, sometimes other people can get there first. But I do think that being more open about like the struggles that you're having and sort of like the team development. And also, I think game studios being more open with each other about like, here's how we do things and here's what succeeded for us. Because it feels like a lot of that knowledge is sort of contained within a single studio and they learn and evolve, but it'd be great beyond conferences if there was more sharing between game development studios. Yeah, I agree. I, I, it seems to me that more and more people are thirsty for that kind of information for a lot of reasons. I mean, it helps create connections with the developers and for so many who want to get into the games industry, it gives them a good sort of primer on, on what it may be like for them. So just thinking again ahead, if you had to make one crazy prediction about our industry, uh, anything that might happen in the next five to 10 years, what would it be? Just one. <laughs> no consoles. <laughs> yeah. No. Con- is it, did you say no consoles? Potentially. Okay. I was surprised that there was a new generation of consoles coming out, I have to say. Yeah. I think in 10 years, nobody will be buying, nobody will be playing physical games anymore. Everyone will be streaming everything. It feels like I, there's no reason why eventually a stadia like thing will just totally dominate the gaming market like that that stadia will be awful until it's not and then it will be all anybody ever uses um <laughs> and I'm, it worries me because i still don't know I, I i don't think anyone has really solved the issues around pricing and about what it means to be a mid-sized game developer who suddenly gets paid per hour of play you know i think there are huge questions around what that means and how we avoid you know, the gutting of the industry in the way that you've seen with like the revenues of Spotify absolutely tanking. Like, that's pretty worrying. Um, yeah. But I do, I do feel like at some point we'll stream all our games and then we'll look back and wonder why anybody ever put a CD into anything. I think for me, it's getting to the point where games are accepted into like wider society. I think that it's, there still feels like games are quite niche, even though everyone's sort of playing them. I feel like we're going to reach a point where there's a younger generation that's always growing up playing games. And as they're getting older, we're soon going to get to a point where like games are sort of seen, in, hopefully in the same way that film is in modern society. I think you're exactly right. And I, we're, we're pretty darn close to that, um, with, I'd say within, the, within a generation of that. And I think that's exciting. And I'm just wondering what sort of experiences and how that's going to change the sort of games that are being made as well. Well, you did mention earlier uh, how we should have potentially more stories and uh, exposure for those who have been in the industry for a long time. And, and maybe uh, as our audience ages too, we'll see a, just a new sort of approach to games for those who 
have been playing all their lives and are now in their 50s, 60s, and 70s and are looking for something a little different. Yeah, I mean, it's great. I mean, you can even see it in the generation of like junior game developers that are coming up now. Like they are very different to the generation that I was studying in. And it's nice to see that that evolution is happening and that more voices and like more diverse candidates are applying to become part of the games industry. Yeah. Well, guys, this has been fantastic. And if people have more questions for you, and assuming they're not complaining about the next patch um, to Joe, <laughs> how can they reach you? Uh, if you used at me on Twitter, I'm at Gosujo, G-O-S-U-J-O-E. Um, yeah, come message me on there and I'm always happy to chat. Yeah, and I'm Mad Hot Dog. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I say it. <laughs> it's what a great name. Well, Joe, Joel, thank you so much for taking the time and for going into a lot of depth uh, about what you guys have done to create I, what, in my opinion, is one of the most entertaining games I have played. It is, it is so much fun. So, and congratulations <laughs> on its success. Thank you very much. It's um, been a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, cheers. Thank you for joining us for the Game Maker's Notebook. For more information on the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, our podcasts, and our other initiatives, please visit www.interactive.org.